maybe even one count. So, so follow up one point. Thank you. Yes, sure. Thank you. Yes, of course. Hmm. So you have political economy. Do, yes. Great. Not many universities have that in the US. I'm I think we can start. So welcome to the session on assessing the impacts of large uh, scale net acquisition. I am very happy to chair the session and we will have different presentations across Africa, land acquisition and land regularization up to Brazil. Right? And uh, I'm very happy and excited. We have changed a little bit the order of the presentation so to accommodate uh, the presenters. Um, and first off uh, is Ms. Kagwanga, yes, and uh, she is, uh, yes, the chief uh, of the African Land Policy Center, yes, which is a joint initiative between the African Development Bank, right, uh, African Union, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. So uh, you have very much experience, 15 years of experience here, and you want to present something, yeah, we are very excited. Well, thank you, thank you. And it's good to be here. Uh, I make this presentation on behalf of my colleague, uh, Gladys, who could not be here. Um, but she's the brains on the geo stuff, the intelligent stuff. I'm just a policy person. So when I present all the modeling and I don't make sense, that you'll know why it's not making sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's it. I think I'll choose. <clears throat> so, um, I'm not sure if I will go through this. I'll probably skip skip through a lot of this, telling you why agriculture is important. But I will focus is really on promoting responsible investments um, in in agricultural value chains. And so this tool was developed to assist member states in that regard. And a lot of people are doing some work in this area. Uh, otherwise, we'll see whether it adds value by including uh, a mapping of land claims. That's the synopsis of it. Mm -hmm. So the context is that um, both the SDGs and Agenda 2063, this is the AU Agenda 2063, identify uh, food insecurity as a real challenge. Um, and we have a lot of commitments on the continent around issues of agriculture, uh, including the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program or the more recent Malabo in 2014. And we also have the UN Food Summit, that uh, Food Security Summit that was there the last year. So we have some commitments around that as well to promote food systems, all of them to, you know, towards uh, those two agenda. And and then from the from our side, the issue of last year land based investments, most member states have identified it as an avenue for improving investments, have tried it have not succeeded, that's a nicer word than failed, <laughs> have not entirely succeeded. And so um, this is an attempt to look at why is it that there hasn't been, you know, we, we know why there hasn't been that kind of success. We developed guidelines and then how do we implement those guidelines to make investments more successful? Should member states decide to go large scale? So they're not saying do large scale, they're saying, should you discuss, you know, move to do large scale? how to better do it. So in, in this case, we are, uh, we are approaching large scale as 200 uh, hectares or more. It might not sound very large in the US, but in Africa that is large. In Ethiopia it's large. In, in, in many of our countries it's really large, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we've had 
uh, a lot of uh, risks surrounding LSLVI. So this is an attempt to de-risk uh, those kinds of investments. Uh, I may did mention that the returns have not been fully uh, realized. Uh, especially there has been a decent franchise of community right, rights to land in the context of these investments. And especially in areas of Africa where a lot of our land is managed under community, under, under traditional um, traditional areas, uh, 70 to 80% of land managed in traditional systems of governance, which are not necessarily well covered in the statutory systems, and the statutory laws, so there are some challenges there. And we've had very severe situations where there have been investors who have had no real conflicts between invest investors and communities, some investors killed, and we just want to be as happened in our countries. Uh, and we want to try and, uh, and, and make it profitable for investors, get the returns governments are looking for, communities benefit, how can we do that? So the Africa Land Policy Center, previously the Land Policy Initiative, uh, developed guiding principles on large-scale land-based investments to try and de-risk somehow these investments. So it's a tool for member states, for investors, for communities to be able to do that. And these guidelines are available on the website, should you be interested. So the, we identified adaptation support tool as one of the areas to support governments in this regard, um, to try and, and you know, increase the probability of, it, of, of, the, of them coming to production and actually being successful and being profitable. Uh, at the time we did our research on LSLBIs, it's a some while back, but um, we, we had Africa uh, accounting for 45% of the, of the large scale land based investment in the world, and only 19% coming under production. So that is really low, especially when you have, you have acquired the land and you're not producing anything on the land, you've moved people in some cases. Um, and so um, that's basically it. Um, I think it's good to highlight that the risks can come from from you not attaining the investments, but also we found that more recently, with the drive and the agenda around the Africa continental free trade area, and countries trying to increase trade, and therefore what you trade in, the products, or the agricultural products that you're going to, to have, the investments have become, you know, there's a lot of demand for investments. And also with climate related goals, uh, in terms of the issue of carbon markets, we found that, again, the demand for land is increasing. And as we know, as the demand for land is increasing, then there's that, um, the communities will become even more disenfranchised. So while these guidelines were developed in, or adopted in 2016, I think it's more urgent now that we really do something about providing this decision support. So the aim, again, of the study is to develop the tools to, uh, yes, <laughs> Uh, improve private sector investments. Private sector includes small water farmers. They are the biggest private sector in Africa, I think. Uh, and so to optimize geospatial data for mapping uh, optimal arable land to invest in agriculture, in priority agricultural value chains and priority meaning what governments have defined as their priority and generate uh, data sets to guide negotiations, are usually guided by investment agencies or ministries with um, with others, and these are, can be foreign or domestic investments. So the web, uh, the mapping tool, um, it's, it's really ongoing work. We have some countries where we are we are working on this, and we we'll just present some preliminary uh, information, and also looking for partners who can advance this work across the continent as well. So again, we have uh, we have three countries: uh, Malawi, Madagascar, and Guinea, and this is. Especially for Guinea, it was based on demand because um, at a very high level, they wanted support to have investments in rice. And we thought, well, where are you going to promote those investments? How are you going to promote them? What do your laws look like? Um, and that's where maybe we should be starting. And so we thought they can be a good candidate for this. And these are priority crops in those countries. So we would be looking at these priority value chains for them. In Malawi, maize, tobacco, groundnuts, tea, and cranberry for commercialization. 
in Guinea cassava groundnuts and rice, and in Madagascar cassava rice and sweet potatoes. And this is where I was telling you I'm not an expert, but <laughs> in glad it is. But um, so the the model, this max and algorithm, whatever you want to call it. So I'm not the person who developed the model. Um, is looking is looking to generate information uh, that would provide information on value chain related variables that people would be looking at. So issues related to yes crop suitability or suitability of value of the value of the of the chain itself but also access to markets, roads, and, and uh, population and population density and others. And then later on, uh, superimpose the issue of the land tenure and land, and land, and land rights as well. So at far, the first stage is the crop modeling, then the value chain component. As you can see on the left-hand side, you have your, 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 your basic data that you would have issues of topography, um, occurrence, climate, and soil fertility in order for you to get on the other side, which is supposed to, you know, in terms of, a, of an output of, of what the map would look like for each country. So, um, in terms of the of the data, of the data, then um, to to look at the at the de-risking, we have what what we included in terms of those that then in terms of the mapping component of especially of the land data itself. The importance of working with the, with the local authorities, the traditional authorities, and then in the context of that, trusted intermediaries in those communities, because it's going to be very difficult for people to just go in there and actually try to collect that that data on land. Who claims the land? You can't just show up and do that. Actually, we want the local people to be able to, to be the ones to do that. So this is the this is the data that we are currently uh, actually collecting in terms of that. It's particip participatory G GIS. And it has been the one that has lagged behind because we really do want to work with governments on going to areas where they have identified some value chains and where it's suitable for value chains. We want to go in those areas, but we also want to, to, to have a participatory approach where we are using the local communities, which some of the governments don't already use, you know, work closely with them. So it's almost like we are, we are learning by doing, we are also teaching. Uh, on how to better map, how to better work with local communities. Remember, we are looking for models that are participatory in nature in terms of the investments as well. And so we developed what we call the AFLIP, the African Land Information Portal, uh, where uh, this information then is available and can be then uh, provided in a format that can be used for the various the various, the various stakeholders who would be involved, for instance, in negotiations. And you can see the kind of information that is available in the portal as well. And then in terms of mapping, usually it's good to present these things in a, in a, in a, in a model format. So the information that you see is only excluding the land tenure and land claims related information. So once that is overlaid, then you are able to see what districts or areas are suitable for what in terms of the main value chains and also the different conditions. But I think our value add, especially because a lot of people can do this, the value add will be on the risk that relates to the land tenure and land rights. In terms of when you go there, who would you speak to? Who would you be including in the conversation in order to de-risk the investments? From the perspective of marginalizing communities, from the perspective of conflict in the local communities and others as well. So I think some results, for instance, from Malawi in terms of the suitable area and, and, and the potential suitable meaning, the total area with suitable climatic soil fertility, elevation and uh, for growing uh, the tobacco maize and groundnuts, and then potential meaning uh, which has medium to low suitability, so to speak. So this is information that would be useful to, to government and to others as well. And then in terms, of, in terms of optimal areas for investments, for instance, you can see for, for tobacco and rice, a high suitability being the data, yeah, you can see quite well, I think, I think for that. In terms of investments in Malawi, again, <clears throat> we are looking at the entire value chain, so we have information relating to roads, uh, electricity, and towns as well. And so this tool 
is going to remain in Malawi with the investments agency. It's always an issue of who is going to be the custodian of, of this. Just keeping time so that I know where the young. Oh, it is. <laughs> yeah, so then uh, this currently is sitting at the ECA in terms of uh, in terms of of the of the portal and it's it's easy to to go in and be able to, to work on it but it's it's a long going one but again in each country that we work with it will be domiciled with the country where we are working. it's it's there a lot of maps you can see and names that I'm sure some of you understand better than I <laughs> yeah if, you are, if Granny's was here she would be very interested in this so in terms of the implications of the study, um, we, we think that this is really an important piece of work in terms of as we are looking to, to promote value chains, both local and regional value chains, and to, to implement some of the commitments that we have made, whether it is land, uh, land from the framework and guideline side, from the guiding principle side, which is similar to the, to the, to the responsible <laughs> agricultural investments that I as well. And, and also to implementation of the Malabo. And we do have guidelines also on the promoting of regional and cultural value chains on the continent as well. Thank you. Great. Should I have any questions? Let's, I have technical questions, so, but uh, I will just, you can provide them to the reporters later. Yes, but please, first to the audience. Yeah, I have several questions, but I'm a land use planner, uh, so this is very much focusing on food security, in, increased productivity, and of course I, I understand the idea of multi-criteria decision models and, and uh, what you've done, suitability analysis, but um, how, well, do you have, do you have the data available because I work in some countries and there is not even a, a map about existing land use. Uh, so and if you have data, what's the quality, uh, rubbish in, rubbish out. So does it provide enough information to do this exercise? I mean, that's one question. The other one is more related to the land use. So what's the existing land use? Because yeah, uh, you're going to uh, a large scale scale up in agriculture. So, what's the impact on the existing land use? I, 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 it, that's because I don't know the the, the context in, in in the three countries mentioned. So, is it subsistence farming or not? Uh, because that's often, yeah, I assume <laughs> different people using the land. So, mm -hmm. there's also a lot of social implications and also environmental implications. So, if you Increased productivity, I assume you use more pesticides, more fertilizers, which have an impact on the environment as well, the, the water system, and so on. You want to answer? You want to? to... Yes, okay. Yeah. So, and again, I'm not the expert on this. Gladys says, unfortunately, she's fast asleep right now, so she can do <laughs> She's at home. Uh, but they are using satellite imagery for some of the data, right? So there is. Um, Sentinel data. Yeah, sorry. Sentinel data. Yeah, Sentinel data. And then we worked. So the ministries, the the mapping agencies in each of the countries, are the, all the information we can get from those agencies are what we are using. I do understand that. You know, if there was better data, you probably get more precision. But I think they were they were quite okay in terms of of some of the data that was available, being able to to to, to give quite a good estimate in terms of the stability side. In terms of the land use side. So the, the, the point of mapping this is to say, this is what actually is on the ground, right? So if you have people claiming the land for certain uses, which is what we are going to overlay now, is that you wouldn't come and wipe out the people when it comes to the investments. And that is what usually will happen. So you negotiate somewhere, maybe in the capital or somewhere else, most of it, that's how it normally happens. And then you would either compensate people, right? You would work out models of compensation or whatever it is. The guiding principles on large scale land based investments in Africa dissuade us from paying off people. They encourage us to integrate people. People, one of the principles is that people are at the center of the large scale land based investment deal. 
So remember, we are trying to implement that. So if there are people already on the ground, you would have a little bit of a red in terms of you do need to find models that are appropriate to integrate people in that. So we think that this tool actually helps that because it tells you where the people are and what they're doing so that you are better able to integrate. Most of the time, government does not know where the people are, what they're doing. Yeah. They just know what's suitable. You can do right here. Yeah, so that's what we hope to reduce the risk is for that. But good questions, of course. So the, the difficulty in, in actually accessing the data, in a way, is reduced because we are, we are from the continental side, we are, we are working from the AU side on commitments that these governments have made. So the data they are providing now for the pilot, they get the model. If they don't provide the data for their own model, then they don't have information. So it's government agencies that are going to be working on this. Yes, I have one question regarding who financed the analysis. Did the countries, did this analysis for the whole country or the private sector when it's interested in investing, the finance, the specific region or the yes, zone where they want to invest? So in this particular case, since these are pilots, okay. we worked closely, I should say that the, the initial funding was provided actually by USAID. We worked closely with USAID. Who, who helped us and we first contracted Daobag, who did some of the preliminary work. But we did a lot of groundwork trying to involve the government, you know, working closely with government, and that's why we were interested in we proposed that we do this and they were willing to do this. So the initial the initial work was, but ECA actually through the UN internal funding, we were able to go to the countries and continue some of the work and regenerate and get the, the, the models up and running. But the initial model was developed by by Dalva. Um, moving forward, we think that this, this is something that government should fund if you want to engage in, in, it's not very expensive, government should fund it. What is expensive and what governments I think would struggle more with is the actual participatory GIS on the ground. Now, that is where we are trying to, those who know the Network of Excellence on Land Governance in Africa, we have a program that is funded by GIZ that has helped us to establish a network of universities working on land governance. And we have been able to help to improve training. But the, on the research and capacity side, we are encouraging governments to work with their universities to be able to do this kind of work. So with the universities being able to do this, it becomes a lot easier uh, to implement. We're not saying it's going to be easy, but we think that our proposal is if government is going to engage in investments, you need to invest to be able to get this done. What we did was in certain, the participatory GIS, again, the most difficult component, you have to go to a certain area, right? So this is a component where, which is very local, locality specific in terms of data collection right now. Yeah. And I think this is where the funding would be needed. So obviously government has either to provide the funding the private sector, yes, we propose that they contribute. They start to benefit from this as well. So if, if, an, if, a, if the private sector is willing to, to invest in a certain country, we wouldn't advise them to invest if they are not aware of what is on the ground, who is on the ground to negotiate with. And this model would be of use to them as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you Joanne, for this important tool in the countries with financial school. Mine is just a good question. Do you consider uh, looking at land values as well, since this is really investment land, uh, land values and prospects of acquiring this land, for instance, for acquiring a floor, so it's most of the best in general? I can almost answer a no on that because I haven't seen it, although my, I have a team of people working on this, but I think it's really interesting. Judy, do you know? My colleague Judy, I think, just walked in. Yeah. Who is more larger than I am. <laughs> I would say that uh, on the issue of access and how the investor would be able to access the land, uh, the aspect of the land tenure systems, because we are, we are overlaying the data with the land tenure system, will really guide us on how do you um, access the land in the material system? Is it communal land? What kind of land tenure system is it? So if an investor is interested, then that would be a guide on how to access to access the land. When it comes to the land values, I think I would confirm John, we've not yet looked at that. 
But yeah, although I think for the private sector, that's an easy one for them, but I think it's useful. I mean, it, it could be useful for those who might not know. It's market for, for some countries, obviously, that are private, privatized land. It will be, it will depend on the market, but that is, that might not, it's something that changes. It might be difficult for you to have a static map around land values. I would imagine it's very dynamic, just like with everything else. But it's data that they can be providing as well. So I don't know why not, Judy. This is this sounds interesting. I like that. Without indicating why you yes. Yes. Yeah, I think for investors that is very interesting. I think it is. And, and and when you say value, then we start talking about what value are you talking about in terms of social, in terms of environmental and other costs as well. So yeah, that's an interest. I like it. I like it. Yes. Maybe I can make a comment also. So so as far as I understand, right, you're mapping soil suitability is a map with uh, land values, right, and accessibility to roads, and basically you provide investors with profitability maps, right? Or, where they can invest, right? And then also, with, uh, you success, you you go to places to map who owns what, uh, who can we talk, where, something, right? So basically, you provide information to investors to be able to negotiate. So the, the implication basically is also that, that that you are facilitating them to negotiate with somebody. But the legal framework around it, I think, is more important is to uh, not allow them to negotiate somewhere else then. Right? Because you want to facilitate the villagers or somebody to, to get some value out of some language, right? But uh, then they should also be aware that, that maybe they don't want to be mapped like that, right? These villagers. So, so it's also a controversial thing to run as a government. And say now you are mapped so that investors can invest here. So I, I, I'm a bit, I would be a bit uh, more careful with the policy side of how it can turn out in the end. Yeah, it's not really that open, I think. So every yes. country has guidelines on how you approach investments. Yes. Um, and they differ from one place to another. I know in many countries there is the requirement of negotiations with the public companies, and almost a bit there is, although there's. You know, there are questions around how much is negotiations happening actually, whether it's on paper, the act. It's actually one sheet where you have to have it signed by a little woman who. But this this is added not necessarily only for private sector. It's for government also to know what they have in terms of resources. So whether it's environmental, in terms of what the, what resource you have on the land. It's also for community. I think beyond that, there is a capacity building element. And I think this also is a tool that is going to facilitate awareness of the community of what exactly value they have. So it works in all ways, but not, not without the capacity development element that you would need to be able to raise awareness, to make them know their value. On the other side, for investors, I think it's very easy. For investors, it's easy to say, this is a tool, we can use it, let's rush and do this. But I think government already has guidelines on how they control the kinds of investments that are happening where which we hope they also follow the frameworks and guidelines which are there. That's the okay. risk that I see. That is a risk, but it's a very good. I think incorporating that in the capacity development yes. element is extremely yes. important. So that's a really good thing. Thank you. Yeah. We still have time for one question, otherwise I would move on. Great. Thank you so much. And Thank I apologize, you. I have to leave. You have to get the two. <laughs> Great, so next is a study on updating the Brazilian land contracts, right? From a uh, presenter is Philip, uh, well, yeah, it's different, <laughs> but yes, it's Philip uh, Bastian right? right? Right on. Thank you very much. You are at the University of Campinas in Brazil, correct? One of it. But you are obviously from the Netherlands. Yeah, at this moment I'm still at Kadesh in the Netherlands. Okay, good. Okay, so, yeah, good afternoon, Paul. Uh, I thank you very much for the opportunity of being here, presenting this paper. Uh, yeah, this 
this paper really uh, is born from out the from out the El Gaf we did in Brazil more or less 15 years ago, where we had, let's say, the one of the missions was to have an idea of how how land tenure is in the country. Okay. Um, yes, the main author is, is Vitor Fernandes, and uh, Kai is also taking part of it. So those are institutions that are aware, uh, involved. Right? Myself. Ima Flora is the one that does the, let's say, putting the maps, the information. And I'm not, as she just said, I'm not a specialist in that. But a part of this has to do with that, so those questions I will also be, let's say, more relevant to answer, and the uh, World Bank is also involved. So this is a um, um, chart of the, land, the Brazilian land administration system that mm -hmm. makes clear that we, yeah, we have so many institutions involved in land administration in Brazil. Oh, so for the environmental uh, group, uh, let's say the environmental ministry, they are in charge of, of one of the cadastres that's called CAR. And that's a, so yeah, uh, uh, differently from the previous presentation, I'm really uh, trying to see what is the main problem that Brazil has in uh, mostly to avoid deforestation, but not only. Uh, so how much land is still not, has not clear ownership or has, yeah. that's, that's our aim always. Yeah, to know. So we go into the, the cadaster that exists and we try to put them together the best way possible to, to have an idea of that. So we did that in 2017, based on information that was available in 2017. So we got, I'm going to stand up. So we, we got information from, from CAR. So this is a cadaster that is, in reality, land use focused on, on, on the forest. So and the, the land owners itself, where it's self-informed. So it's always a question. Eh? And then we used uh, this Senieri, uh, Kafir, and they together get to be, so that is the Ministry of Economy. So I'm working since El Gaf to put all those people together and try to make them understand each other and, and work together. But here is so another cadaster that is linked to the notice cadaster. So this cadaster is more or less uh, secure on land ownership. Then you have indigenous, indigenous territories, it is another cadaster, and all land that is of nobody should be here by the Ministry of uh, Public Services of Management and Innovation. This is a new. Uh, so, just to, for you to see that it's. It, Brazil is interesting because we have lots of information, but it's not integrated, so we don't really know what's happening. So the 2017 effort is this. So we got information from all those, uh, some other information. I'm not going to go deep into, and we created what is called Atlas da Agropecuária Brasileira. That is also a platform that people can assess and all that to to have a, a, a view of of how land is in the country. But the main question that they came to me because they were already making those maps and all that. Is that they, they didn't understand yeah, how how should we how should we what criteria should we use to establish what is the reality? Yeah. So yeah, I developed this idea. So the, the private property register that the SNCI suggests so that is INCRA is high and low possibility of overlapping, possibility of changing tenure low. So that was the highest priority. So we went down, so title land from Terra Legal to Lombola. This is ex slaves land, uh, indigenous people, protected conservation areas, and so on. And then one of the last one is that. And for us, it's very important to, to say that because people are using car as if it was the reality of land tenure in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to show is that, yeah, it can be used 
shouldn't throw it away, but we have to use it with criteria. It's more or less the idea. So here we have, not to put the map, but just for you to have an idea that we, we put everything in there and we know more or less where, where everything is in, in Brazil based on those information that exists, let's say. That's what we did in 2017. We, we presented here in 2019, but people continue using car, only car as it was the, 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 the whole show. So with this atlas, you can zoom in and look at uh, each region. So we were talking about part of the Amazon region and, and, and can even go deeper into and uh, how it all is. Made. So from all that, for me, the most important was this, huh? to have an idea of what, what do we really have. And so we talked about 850 million hectares in the country. And then, yeah, what, what is the reality? So yeah, pro pro private properties from a car. And so we took away the overlappings, we took away all what was possible. And this is uh, what we came, properties from in CGF, so 22% uh, is, is, let's say, private properties, then private properties from car, from uh, Terra de Gao, the Quilombolas, and so on. Indigenous, those, those informations are very important because we have um, more than 10% of the surface of the country with, with indigenous people, and we have uh, a bit more than 10% with, with conservation units. So that's, that's quite a lot of land that is under that situation. So, but for us, what, for me, what is important, all this is those two. So, undesignated lands, we have 54,000 million hectares in Brazil. So, and unregistered, 141 million hectares, based on this information that we had at the time. So, I, as the land administrator uh, uh, yeah, person, I, I want to solve this. How am I going to solve this? Eh? But at least, this was the first time that we had an idea of what exist in the country and what we should do. And who is in charge of that? Yeah, states, uh, company, uh, states. The yeah, INCRA is national for national land. Uh, yeah, it has to do with the legislation of Brazil. In 1850, they established what is not private is public, but they never established what would be this public land. So this is what I wanted to, to understand. Yeah? How much of that is still yeah, without use. And we also know from other literature and, and, and investigations we did is that the most, uh, most of the, of the deforestation occurs exactly on those kinds of land because nobody is owner, nobody knows. And so they occupy uh, deforestate and then they try to legalize it. So this is what we have to work with more, more, more urgently, I think. So, uh, full map color, legal security from large public areas, yeah. Okay. So, now we are working in the new one. And so, to, to increase, what is important is that the, both of the main cadastres that we have, so the CAR and the CGF, they are, they continue to be, uh, <clears throat> to be, uh, yeah. information is still going into, so each time in, in Brazil, it's, it's very interesting that each time that you have, to, that you change, that is because of this legislation here, uh, each time that you change anything in your property, the owner has to make a new uh, uh, georeference map and send it to INCRA. So that is how the, the map system is, is increasing. And the car is the same, but for some reasons, the, the car had the opportunity to establish very strict uh, um, ways to make people make a new car every year, more or less. And, and because they only get the, the credit or they only can sell their, their products if they have a car. So those two cadastres are continually growing. One side is good, but on, on the other side, we, we get some problems. So. Uh, so we are cleaning, the new addition cleaning and uh, uh, the overlap and uh, overlap analysis of certified properties. 
because Inca also had more, has more than one cadaster, so it has to be clean and that's done. Analysis of the overlap between the Inca and the car basis, cleaning up and analyzing car overlaps, regrouping the uncharacteristic car, aggregation of databases from different land uh, layers. So that is what we are doing now with the new data. So we are using CGF, so that is Inca information, so let's say the the, the, the legal uh, land uh, that is registered, the type of legal land is in there. And again, uh, this more or less the same uh, criteria we are using here to try again. Uh, so the, the, the uh, sustainable yeah, conservation units, military areas, rural settlements, but it's always uh, gathering of information that exists for me in, in Brazil, and there exists there is a lot of, of that information. Eh? So not non-titled legal land, car again, eh? it's all all in there. So one of the things we, we noticed, uh, uh, yeah, I'm talking already quite a bit, is so how do we do with with the overlappings that we have? because we have to clean that up. So we created two figures here. One is the car premium uh, and the car poor, what we call. So the, the car uh, premium is, is the one that it's more or less clear, most of it, no overlaps. And the car poor has a bit more of overlaps, but as we don't have other information, we use that. That's more or less the way we are always doing, trying to, to, to get as far as possible. But, but this is a good image. And so this is, let's say one property, and so as each year they have to make their georeference map and for the car, so this is what we see in the reality in one property. So we have to transform this in yeah, something like this. So how, how do we do that? Yeah, that is the specialist, they do that, and, and so that we, we know clearly what is, what is the, what is what we want. So, the criteria of obtaining precision in parcel certification is the legal certainty of the rights, the accuracy of the geospectral information, the possibility of receiving overlaps. So if you receive, you can receive an overlap, your information is less important. The possibility of changing the domain. So there are areas that we know, like the car or like, uh, like, uh, other kinds of, of land, it can, there can be a change in, in, in the domain. So th those ones we don't prioritize. So this is, this is an ongoing study. It's not finished yet. Uh, we had some issues with, uh, with the ownership of the, of the information and who was going to have the, the platform. But uh, so it's not completed yet, but we already had some important numbers. So the amount of, of polygons. So we, we estimate that we have around five to six million uh, properties uh, in Brazil. So yeah, most of them are in car, uh, rural settlements. And you see, so for each year, man, what, what happens? Uh, and then undesignated public forest, this is an added other category that is also. I don't like it very much, but we use it. Uh, the CGF, this is still rather small. So we use quite a bit of the information of the car because CGF doesn't have all, all the information. And nevertheless, it's the most accurate uh, information on the, legal, on the legal side, let's say. Uh, the community territories, indigenous reserves that are homologated, and, and so on. So, for us, it's already interesting to see this evalu uh, evaluation of how it evolved, huh? and here the areas that each of them have from that one 2017 to the one in 2021. So here we see a little change in, in undesignated public forests. So here we have 28 million in, in, in forests. Uh, and the difference between the sum is what is not yet uh, uh, defined that we have. 
So we are working on, on all those numbers. Those are uh, draft numbers, let's say. But uh, the main idea that I really wanted to, to share with, with you is that it is it has been possible for us to have a clearer vision of, of how this, the land tenure situation is in Brazil, only using the cadasters that already exist, the map cadasters, and, and from there we can have a good view of what is needed to do in, in the country. Here we have, an, uh, let's say, the other side of the information, uh, the, 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 about the, the amount of cars. So as I said, each property has to deliver its georeference map to the, to, to the environmental uh, ministry. And uh, many of them, so this is the amount of, of, of car on public land. So for me, this is really grabbing on that. Because people are trying to, to legalize by making their map on other areas. Uh, uh, and for there, from them, from there, try to have it legalized. So this is the amount of, of uh, properties that make car on areas that are restricted. So this is, and, 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 and here we can see an amount of, of land that is used or that is established in, in conservation units and how much deforestation there is there. And, and so this is in, in public uh, areas. This is where it's without any ownership. So there's quite a bit there without any ownership. Uh, and this is in, in, on public land. So here we are talking about quite a bit of, of land that for sure uh, is being, there is an effort to try to grab it because it's not clear who, 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 whose land it is. So it's important because, yeah, the bit of the history, when, when they were creating the car, uh, we were in, in an uh, interministerial uh, group with all those ministries and they were presenting it and me and some other people said, Okay, car is good, but please make a link between the, the, the cadastre of car that you are creating with any of the cadastres of land ownership that we have. And we have at least three different, one, one at, the, at the registry, one at the INCRA, uh, and one, one at, the, at the Ministry of Finance. But they said, no, we want a specific uh, uh, environmental or land use cadastre. We won't, don't want to have anything to do with this issue of land rights because that is too complicated for us, you know. So, uh, and it's interesting because at this moment, more and more people are seeing that we have to, to deal with environmental issues. We have to deal with land rights. This, this conference is, is a good show of that, and uh, so this is the main idea that I wanted to. To deal with, to to data, to <laughs> show you. Okay. Thank you I very talk, much. I talked a lot. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yes. Questions from the audience? <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> then I, I ask, yes. So, uh, what for researchers like myself, but also did a lot in Brazil, right? It's super interesting would be to have this full cadaster also trying to in, include the year when it was registered for each of these single uh, categories. Do you have any way of doing it or doing it? The year that it was registered. Yes. With for car, we have more or less, yeah. Yeah. but for the others, we don't, right? Maybe you have or do. I would say, and I, I think all of them is possible to have. Yes. Because the, the year that uh, a 
an, an uh, observation unit was created, we know. We got that. That's the indigenous people we know. That's the, the ownership register. We know the moment, the year that he put it in the system. Okay. That's, but that's not the year that it's his, because it could be his much. Because the, you put in the system in the year that you exchange the property, or when you when you ex, when you change anything in your register, so if you ask for for a, yeah, if you sell it, or or when you do anything else, with it, then you have to 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 make the gel reference plan. Yes, yes, yes. So that is the moment. So do you have any idea, I mean, that was like 16% were under the head of Do you have any idea how much it is only for the Amazon region, or very region? Mostly, most of it is Amazon, so it would say 90%. So the share within the Amazon has been much, much higher. Yeah, yeah, 90%, at least. At least. Under the head. Huh? Yeah. Of these fourteen percent, yeah, yeah. Nine to yeah. Nine, yeah. Okay. Say hard less also a little bit, but mostly it's the Amazon. No more questions. Any questions? So, so do you know any of the techniques, right? How do you? Uh, I mean, basically, you just have a heuristic, right? Order it from one to fourteen, and then you decide. Okay, this is precedence over the other register yeah. and over the other register. So yeah. Yeah. So basically, you carve out the polygons yeah. and, the and the evaluate the polygons. Right? Yeah. And then you take out the overlappings. Okay. And then you. Do and you know how you do it with the car because you showed us a map, right, where the car registry is uh, sometimes like that, sometimes a little bit. Like this sometimes, so they multiply, they register every year, but every year it, it looks a little bit different. Yeah. How do you solve that? I, I can't tell them, but they know how to do And is that still accessible over your database? How it changes over the years? Or is it, do you have to go back to the carpet? I think it will be available. Yes. When, when, when the new platform is ready, it will be available. That would be great because when I think about it, right? Because car is basically only for proving that you are that you are compliant with environmental laws and in your side, right? So one year I deforest a little bit here, and I draw my polygon differently than the year before, no? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't think it's only that. It's also there are also uh, let's say uh, issues with the mapping itself, and because it's mm -hmm. self map and 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 the, uh, the 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 currency is not really def defined. So it's it's possible that uh, other issues happen with that. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was really nice. Yeah, we are currently on time, but uh, we can go on. <laughs> so our next presenter will really help change the order, which be would be Mr. Aka, right? Yes. Ah, uh, Mr. Aka. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Yes, you're at uh, in China at the uh, Guizhou Jinzhou University of PhD yeah. students. Yeah. It's very nice to be here. Yes. He will present uh, his work on yes, the livelihoods and how the communities. The floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And mm -hmm. thank you for swapping my spot with the academic because. Is going to save me a lot of time. You have more time now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, my paper uh, on behalf of my co-authors, and uh, one of uh, the co-authors is here, Doctor uh, Wanjin. Okay. So it's going. It's going to be like. Uh, a student presentation, so I will uh, going to, I will briefly walk you through the introduction 
the methods uh, discussions and finally I will wrap up with uh, some concluding remarks. Yeah, before I just jump into the main part, uh, so this, uh, this research is part of my PhD dissertation that uh, I'm working and it's part of a research project, uh, the distribution of impact of large scale transactions in Ethiopia. Uh, yeah, the researcher is here. If you have any questions regarding this project, you will direct me to the main uh, searcher here, uh, Dr. Solomon. Okay, so I, I will not talk much about the motivation because it has been said a lot in the previous uh, presentations. Uh, yeah, uh, so it's it's about large scale land uh, investments and sometimes it's called large scale land based uh, investments. It's, it's a matter of naming, but the background is uh, similar. Uh, so uh, yeah. Uh, this is the data, the extent of large scale land transactions that's happening in the in global south. Uh, so, yeah, it's like started in the 2008 uh, economic crisis, uh, the price rise, and starting from that, it's continued, even though right, the pace of transfer is decreasing, like uh, starting from 2013. And mostly, most of the investments went to uh, like the countries in the global south region, including Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia. And most of the investors originate from like uh, from the global north or from the developing countries, including uh, North America, Europe, and even the, the Gulf countries, including uh, China and Russia. Uh, yeah, so uh, the pace of transfer and the size of land involved uh, cause a lot of debate in the uh, in the literature, especially in the first period of the pro proliferation time, like around 2015-16. There were uh, there was a continued debate uh, regarding the benefits and the costs of such kind of investments, and there are debates that these investments are useful for. Uh, these developed countries in the global south. And there are also some other critics that argue that these investments will not have benefit to the, uh, the destination countries uh, because the objective of such investments is to, to ensure the availability of food supply for investor countries, especially uh, who originate from developed uh, countries. And, that results disposal, disposition of uh, land uh, indigenous community. Yeah, so after like two decades of uh, the proliferation time, empirical, empirical evidence start to emerge. And this empirical evidence also show like contracting effects of such kind of investments. Some uh, research show that it has a negative impact and some other research show that it has a positive impact. And most of these uh, empirical researches are based on case studies. Uh, so they will not show the general picture of uh, such investments on the local community welfare and uh, livelihoods. So the objective of this uh, paper is to, produ to, to produce a picture that show the overall impact kind of investments. So, so we conduct a meta analysis in order to obtain a, a, a single effect size that show the overall effect of such uh, investments. So uh, coming to the methodology, uh, like we follow the uh, meta-analysis uh, procedure, uh, the guideline for meta-analysis for of economic research network. And uh, yeah, we search the empirical uh, papers uh, using keywords combined from large scale land investments and uh, from the welfare and the livelihood uh, keywords. So we combine them and we use the Web of Sciences, uh, Google Scholar, and uh, Scopus. And uh, we obtain like more than 2,000 empirical uh, research. So we, using the Prisma guideline, we filter them down. And we finally, we obtain that there are 37 uh, studies that use quantitative 
return of it due to indicate the impact of such investments on welfare and uh, livelihood of local communities. So our meta-analysis will be based on uh, the estimates extracted from the such seven uh, primary studies. So if we see the descriptive part, so uh, most of these primary studies use income, the impact of large-scale investments for income, followed by, yeah, most of them use for security, then income, then assets, and there are also other uh, outcome variables that indicate the way they value, including employment, empowerment, uh, inequality, poverty, and uh, others. And regarding the type of data they use, uh, most of them are cross-sectional studies. Uh, some of them are panel studies, and these studies are most of them use the, the DIP method to evaluate the impact. And they, they, they are mostly mixed uh, quantitative research uh, designs. And uh, we also try to map the source of the researchers based on their institutional affiliation and uh, the case studies that they use in order to evaluate the impact of such researchers. And we find out that uh, most of them are from like Canada, Europe, and uh, investments are the case studies are most of them in uh, Africa. Okay, then in, in order to calculate the mean effect size uh, that shows the unique value uh, to indicate the impact, so we use partial correlation coefficients, which is mostly used in uh, economic analysis. And it simply shows the relationship between the uh, the large scale land investments with the welfare or livelihoods. And it's calculated from the primary statistics, statistics and uh, degrees of freedom. And it simply shows the average uh, effect size. However, it, it will not take into account the differences in each study. Like it will not take into account study specific factors. So in order to take that into account, we use the random effect uh, model to compute the mean effect size. Uh, and the result uh, looks like this. Uh, as you see, there is a substantial heterogeneity uh, in effect size among the different results among the set of uh, empirical studies, primary studies that we use. And the overall impact, uh, which is indicated here, is like uh, 0 0.043. It's a correlation option because yeah, it's less than one. But the, the magnitude is quite small. But uh, what encourages us is it's at least positive. It's not negative. There are some studies that report negative effect sizes, but on average, uh, it's positive, uh, which indicates that the impact of such investments are at least positive on uh, local communities. And uh, we also conduct a sub subgroup. Uh, mean effect size calculations based on the different countries that these researches are conducted. And we, uh, we find actually a very uh, interesting result that uh, the mean effect sites are negative in some of the countries, uh, including uh, Cambodia and uh, Ethiopia and Sierra Leone, specifically because much of the uh, the estimates are originated from Ethiopia and Sierra Leone. Uh, and we also conduct a subgroup analysis based on the outcome variables that indicate welfare and uh, livelihoods. And this shows the mechanism uh, through which such investments improved uh, welfare and livelihoods of uh, local communities. And asset creation uh, and income are. Uh, Actually, the pathways with such investments improved uh, welfare and livelihood of uh, local communities. And uh, so, why these mean effect sizes are heterogeneous across countries? So, why are they heterogeneous? Uh, so, uh, there are many studies that show that uh, these large scale land investments uh, convert towards countries that have lower tenure security or uh, low, yeah, lower tenure security. So taking that in mind, 
uh, we resort into uh, yeah, the performance of large scale agricultural investment deals, compliance with the warranty guideline in responsibility in responsible governance of NU. So the land matrix uh, created this uh, initiative and we use these uh, results in order to see whether there is some kind of relationship with uh, the BTGT results and the mean effect size of different countries that we have created. Uh, so this one shows the BTGT, uh, the BTGT results uh, and I just we try to map this result with the uh, mean effect size. So actually there is no like uh, a meaningful relationship between them. However, we can say that there are some countries with higher performance in BGGT and uh, higher mean effect size. Uh, yeah, and we also conduct a publication bias if the publishers like select studies with uh, which has uh, larger standard errors. So we use a, a panel plot and the far test. So there is no publication bias. Uh, and so we also conduct any calibration analysis in order to find out the cause of heterogeneity in effect size. So the type of outcome models, research design used in these studies and the estimation characteristics reported are actually the causes for the heterogeneity in the effect size of the primary studies. So by this, uh, and uh, regarding the conclusion, uh, like we conduct uh, a meta based on 176 estimates uh, extracted from set seven primary studies and the overall mean effect size is quite small but positive. Uh, the outcome based subgroup analysis highlights the mechanisms and the small mean effect size and the heterogeneity across countries may fairly be attributed to poor implementation monitoring and evaluation of such uh, investments. And in relation to land governance that is present before me, yeah, there are uh, a lot of guidelines uh, as in different regions, the BGGT at the global level, the framework of guidelines on land policy in Africa, the Asia. Uh, so there are a lot of guidelines uh, to ensure that such investments are beneficial for uh, local communities. Even though there are a lot of guidelines, the results show that there is heterogeneity in the impact of such uh, investments. So the evidence generated by the primary studies focus, uh, focused from assessment of single investment projects, which makes it uh, very difficult to generalize findings beyond the uh, community level where such investments are carried out. Thus, further studies could use cross-country information to explain the heterogeneity between countries. We also observed that the overall impact of such investments at national level that could accrue like either through the exports or through the increased uh, revenue or production is not account so far. So other states also could consider this one. Uh, yeah, so by this, I, I conclude uh, my presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for the nice literature all of you, that's great. Do you have questions for uh, this one? Yeah. Yes. Teach us, please, about sort of the uh, mean effect size. Yes. Because I, I, I have fully grasped so how you calculate it and what the meaning of 0 0.04 is now. Uh, uh, yeah. Can, so you, what, each of the papers analyze a different outcome, right? Yeah. So how, how can I interpret the uh, mean effects us. Uh, yeah, so it is uh, a technique in uh, meta-analysis uh, literature. Yes. Uh, so there are different methods that are used to compute the mean effect size. Mm -hmm. So one of the methods is the correlation quotient. Actually, correlation quotient shows the association between two variables, right? Yes. And it is going to be like between zero and one. 
Yes. Yeah. So you, so when you when you obtain a certain kind of magnitude, like you interpret the association uh, between the two. Yes. Uh, okay. So how we obtain that? Yes. So the, the purpose is to obtain a single value, which is the average of all uh, steps. Yes. Yeah. So there is a technique. To be, uh, that is used to average. So the first is this formula, the yes. origin function formula. Basically. How is it then balanced between zero and one, or uh, between minus one and one? Right? Of course, if it's yes. negative, yes, you are. So how do you, how do you, how, so t is again what? Yeah, t, yeah, right. T is the t statistics of the primary study. For example, there will be one study that evaluates the impact of that scale on transaction one for three years. Yes. So that study reported the data, the, the impact of full security, and it also reported the statistics, the sum size, yes. that is of them. Yes. So TIJ inputs the T statistics of the GS estimate on the ICE study. What does nothing to do with the effect size, but it only has to do with the precision of the... Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the precision is the yeah. effect size. Yeah, it's not that much different. So it will be calculated from the t-statistics. So the, the main purpose is to combine all the studies together. So in order to do that, we, we use this uh, formula. T is the t-statistics of that study. I can, the t-statistics is... Measuring the precision of the estimates, right? So I can yes. have a very precisely estimated close to zero effect, right? Or a very high effect yes. uh, that is, uh, but with a large uh, standard error. Right? Yes, yes. And so the T statistics, so I don't see how R is now represented of the effect. We, we also have the degrees of data, which contains the element sample size yes. used in that study. Let me get yes. because yeah. for me it's strange because each study is is looking at the effect in different ways, with different yes. variables. Yeah. So let's say one is uh, the impact on, on income, yeah. the other one is for So how, how how are you going to put them all together and mm -hmm. then get an average? And that's the beauty of the yeah, but this is a, that is, we will not bother whether it's income or full security. What we take into account from those estimates is their, their T statistics and their degrees of freedom. And then we, we combine and calculate the average from there. It's, a, it's like a meta analysis uh, guide learning process. But why don't you use the COVID or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, that's what a... actually look at uh, the effect sizes and yeah. compare the effect sizes. Yes. You're looking at the T statistics. Uh, yeah. So, so that's what I mean with what I didn't grasp. Right? Yes, you are right. Uh, it's not one. normalized between zero and so uh, between minus one and one. Yeah. Yes. Well, I don't see it. Uh, yeah, in the paper, then uh, we just use, uh, we normalize between zero and one. And okay. then we calculate the partial correlation option. And then for the interpretation, we revert it back. Okay. And so then there is a lot that I didn't uh, present here okay. in the paper. Uh, but regarding the quants uh, quotient, mostly uh, in economic uh, economics analysis, the correlation option is used. And so I follow that. Yeah. I just want to understand. <laughs> so, right. so uh, yes, so zero point to zero four. That could be higher. That's why you say it's small. Yes. Yeah. And what is the main uh, main uh, thing that you say uh, drives the effect towards positive? Can you can go back to the into rules analysis? Okay. Yeah. So this, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, when you put like well, uh, like, uh, well, yeah, 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 the yeah. yeah. regression results here. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. If yeah. You, you say you find the largest 
the effect is the, so where's the mean uh, of the mean outcome? Where the mean you? outcome is here. This, this one is to explain why there is uh, heterogeneity in effect size uh, from different studies. Yes, and the uh, mean is here. This one is the mean. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. No, need a mixed category. Go back to the second. Go back like this. Here, here. No, the table, the table. Language here. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So you regress the data on R, I, J, right? That's your outcome basically, and then you say, okay, this is a type of outcome variable. So it's, if it's about welfare, the value is higher. Right? Yeah. So it's like a jumping, right? It's a yeah. If the primary study uh, uses like Does income it, or okay. for security, it's like that as a yes. so I that as a welfare indicator. Yes. So I say that then it's one and zero. Why do you control for publication status? Like why do yeah. you press that? Yeah, publication, uh, you know, the Effect size, like the distance, this one, and much like correlation coefficient, may depend on the publication status. There are some studies that I can check from the scholar, the baby literature, which are like dissertations for which are not public. So I use uh, a zero and one control to see if the publication status really explains the heterogeneity and the mean effect size. But why don't you regress it on something different, like what you feel that legal status of the of, uh, of land uh, regularization can be the right? So I wanted to give a little bit more of policy context, right? To regress this on on how is the legal organization of land rights in this country? Uh, what is the traditional land rights uh, legal system? That like, what is the Ethnic diversity, it's something that makes us understand where the effect can drive positive, right? It's positive. Something, because if it's about land tenure and interest, okay, yeah, here you I just like, no. yeah, yeah. Just, uh, to, to explain that, uh, just, just I, I come here. These are the countries that the primary studies are obtained for, yes. So some studies like they contribute like, two estimates, one estimate. Yes. Some others, like uh, for example, Ethiopia, it uh, contributes like fifty-eight estimates, a, a large number of studies conducted in Ethiopia. Yes. Uh, yeah, we. Uh, I was also thinking about that, and that is why I brought this here uh, because it's it becomes very difficult to 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 incorporate country level indicator. With a primary study, a primary study label uh, data. Yeah. Uh, so it's the is what you have for that most quick one. Yes. The. Ah, yes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. Very good. It's for the two guys out there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank yeah. you very much. Yes. Are there any other questions to these? Technicalities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. 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 Please, it is now Josephine Montfort, yes? And she is presenting on an issue of land use change, basically, yes? Why people do convert from cocoa or cocoa to mining, yes? How actually people can benefit from more this. Yes? <laughs> And so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for waiting. I know it's a bit different today. Yes. So I'm presenting on behalf of my team on converting to four farms to school mines. I appreciate your attention. Yes. Uh, hello? Yes. I appreciate your attention. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> so, 
I'm presenting a converted for coal from City Gold Mines negotiation and compensation outcomes for farmers in Ghana. Um, Everybody is very short. So you have okay. time of okay. Thank you. So you have 40 minutes. Okay. Pressing the wrong button. So, uh, Ghana is the highest producer of gold on the continent and the second highest in the world. And this uh, position is attracting a lot of investors into mining. This is happening on license scale, which is um, license large scale mining, license small scale mining. And then there's another form of mining, which is artisanal and small-scale mining. Artisanal and small-scale mining is uh, they are unlicensed, informal, and they take place mostly on small-scale basis. So it can be a couple of um, acres to just a small plot of land. They either have a sophisticated gadgets such as excavators, or they just use rudimentary tools. So that's ASM going forward. For cocoa, Ghana is the second highest producer in the world. Um, it's mainly on smallholder basis, so between two to five hectares, and it's found by about 550,000 households, but six million people are dependent on it. But unfortunately, most of these cocoa farmers, I'm sure we know about that, are described as poor. Now, a look at the map on the left shows us where the gold bearing lands are, and we can see that they are along the um, southwestern part of Ghana. And then this map here shows us that uh, cocoa is also incident around the same place. So, what does that mean? Immediately, competition for land. This competition means that once gold has a higher economic value than cocoa, there's conversion of cocoa farms into mining taking place on both large scale and small scale. So by large scale, I mean they are formal uh, mining companies who obtain licenses and convert these farms, and they are informal private arrangements between smallholders and ASM operators. This doesn't seem to be uh, stopping anytime soon because 25% of Ghana's cropland area has been eliminated for mining purposes. And um, already 19,000 hectares have been converted. This is a very modest figure because we don't have statistics fully on it. So, what happens to this 550,000 and more who are dependent on cocoa farming? Regulations, so national guidelines, international, uh, international guidelines, lo 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 local regulations, and societal norms are saying that there should be negotiations between these smallholders and their miners so that adequate compensation is paid to them. So these are some of the regulations, both international and local. But what do we know? So as kind of literature is telling us that these negotiations, and I think the first presenter mentioned this, are imbalanced, and they are under permeable regulatory regime. For example, there are problems with identifying who the rightful recipients are, their methods of valuation are not well established, and it leads to inadequate compensations. But then our question is, what about the informal private negotiations? Where is, it is taking place under societal norms or local regulations sort of. And when I say local regulations, 80% of Ghana's lands are owned by either chiefs or families. Mm -hmm. And then the local systems are that once you need land, you go and see the land owner, negotiate, pay the right amount, and then the land can be transferred to you. So we can also say that the rightful recipients are known, but what is happening in there? And that is what piqued our interest. That is the background, the objective for our research. So we want to find out, investigate the factors that influence negotiation. But before that, let me say that the few studies have not really delved into it like in the case of the last girl mines, but the outcomes are a bit mixed. So we want to go in there and find out what are the factors that influence these negotiations 
by not looking at the informal private lenders alone, but by comparing it to the formal ones as well. And then also examine the outcomes, and by outcomes we mean the compensation agreements, the amounts, and how they are utilized. So for methodology, we also did a case study of which, um, so it was a qualitative a research methodology using case studies. So we found two cases in the Ashanti region of Ghana. And it's interesting, these are neighboring communities. We, we gave them pseudonyms, Tete and Kwashi. They, they have distinct conversion scenarios. So community one, which is Tete, they have conversion with the last low mine. So this is a formal deal. And then the neighboring community, which is Kwashi, they had conversion for a negotiation with ASM operators. So we did data collection through interviews, non-participant observations, and records. The interviews were semi-structured and in-depth, and we kept going back and forth in order to delve deep into the subject matter. And then we reached our respondents with repulsive sampling. They were made up of three groups. First, we looked at the regulatory institutions, and then local authority and traditional authorities, and then the affected farmers, representatives of the mining companies, and ASM operators. Um, then we transcribed and then coded, we had 1113 codes, and out of these, we uh, generated 21 sub codes, and four major themes emerged in Kashi, five in Tete. So we'll go into these themes. Just because I, I, it was too quick for me, can you repeat oh, uh, what uh, Tete and Kashi uh, are there? Yes, so Tete is the first community which had conversion with the last skill man. So they have the formal conversion scenario. And then Kashi is the second community with a conversion with ASM operators. Informal. Informal. Yes. So, so one is Tete, large scale, large scale formal, Kashi, informal. Thank you. So these are the main things. The factors that affected the negotiations were one, the composition of the negotiation team, two, influence of social networks, three, knowledge and information asymmetry, and then there was intimidation in the case of Kete, delays with enticement in the case of Kashi. And then there was a fifth team which was absent in Kashi, that is pollution. So we'll look at each of these. But before we delve into each of these, I'd like to establish that the negotiations took place under the, the regulations in place. So Tete again was for the formal negotiations. It took place, it was guided by the Minerals and Mining Act. They obtained formal licenses, they organized community fora, they developed all the necessary environmental reports, and then they set up a compensation negotiation committee. In the case of Kwashi, it was guided by the local practices of the land. I look at the, these factors that affected the negotiation. So first, we look at the composition, uh, composition of the negotiation team. In Tete, this was 78 members, but um, as and when necessary, they formed subcommittees. And this comprised of mining uh, representatives of the mining company, farmers and landowners, local authority, traditional authority, and state institutions. The miners, that's the last skill mine were represented by their experts from their community consultative committee, but the farmers ended up representing themselves. And why did this happen? Um, aware of their constitutional rights, the farmers contracted a valuer. So the valuer came in with his team, but the mining company refused to negotiate with the valuer because he didn't belong to the Ghana Institute of Surveys. And then the valuer is supposed to buy uh, our state laws, the value is supposed to be paid by the mining company, but he said that to avoid being compromised, it should be paid by the farmers. So he either takes 30% of the additional negotiated sum or 10% of the whole. But the mining company sent representatives to the farmers to tell them that instead of taking some of the money that we give you to pay the value, why don't you let us negotiate directly? Because of this, there was disagreement between the farmers and some of their leading uh, negotiators also pulled out. So in the end, the valuer didn't represent them, and the farmers had to represent themselves in the negotiation team. To um, 
present the other four teams, which is pollution, influence of social networks, intimidation, and knowledge and information asymmetry. I'll support it with some of the quotes, the direct quotes that we have. So for collusion, uh, there was a situation whereby most of the leading and influential people among the farmers were employed by the mining company. And this quote here says that we replaced the chief farmer because he was employed by the company, but they refused to recognize our chief farmer. So the chief farmer helps with the, the surveyors of the mining company, you know, to go and survey the farms, etc. When he was employed, the farmers decided that he had become compromised, so they will no longer let him represent them. But the mining company insisted that they would not recognize the new one. So they continued to work with him. And then also the chief at that time was um, old and sick, so his nephew was asking for him. And the nephew was also given a contract by the mining company. So he also became compromised. And then finally, uh, this was from the valuer. They singled out his quantity surveyor and later employed him. So these were collusive taxes that were used you know, to compromise the negotiation process. For influence of uh, social networks, this farmer said, that, look at these important people from this town. If they could not say something for, for us, then who else can help us? By important people, he meant that the district chief executive at the time of the district was from this particular community. And that's a very important position. And then also an appeal court judge of Ghana was also from this community. So the farmers at their wit end had um, gone to these people to advocate for them. So at least say something, but at least advocate for them. But there was no help from these people. So that also led to a sense of hopelessness to give in to whatever the mining company were willing to give them. And then also there was um, the factor of intimidation. So three of the leading uh, farmers who were very vocal you know, in the negotiations were arrested and detained on false charges in jail for a number of nights. And when they were out, they were made to sign a bond you know, to, be, to be of good behavior or to be quiet. And when these people finally came out, they were quiet. The others, you know, they were leading the fight. So definitely the others were not able to fight much. So this led to this rhetorical question that was asked among the community members that do you have money or clout to litigate with the government or the mining company? And the knowledge and information asymmetry was the big one. So as we all know, the starting point of any negotiation is that you know what you are requesting for and you can defend it. And that would be a robust financial calculation, valuation of their farms. But this was absent. Okay, so what basically they did was that um, they benchmarked what they were asking based on what another large scale mining company was, was paying in another region of Ghana. So this uh, director of the mining company said they don't do any calculation, they just mention that amount. You know, so to him, they, they, they didn't defend exactly what they want by any uh, tangible calculation. And uh, this farmer was saying that they, they asked for what another mining company was paying, which was much higher than what um, the mining company in Tete was paying. But the company said that they cannot pay because they are relatively a younger company. See, so the absence of the, the knowledge, the financial knowledge, went against them in this case. And it was found up by an opinion leader who said that if you look at a community like this, definitely our knowledge will not match those up there meaning the mining company representatives. So our contribution will be less. I'll move on now to Pashi, which is the scenario of the informal negotiation. And in Pashi, we see here that 9% um, negotiated with an experienced person. The remaining 91 decided either to negotiate alone or with family and friends. And why was this? Similar to what I did before, I'll support these teams with the quotes. So for the composition of the negotiating team, one said his friend had mind, so his friend had the experience to help him. Another also thought he's not a child, so he has the, the ability to negotiate. And the third said that because he owns the land, he believes he has the ability to negotiate. So they didn't see the need to bring in any expertise. For uh, the influence of social networks, this farmer in Kwashi said, you know, reputation in such communities is everything. So if you persistently refuse to mine, even though gold has been found on your land, 
you are seen to be progressive that you do not want to prosper. So that was enough for them to give in on the negotiation table. For intimidation and enticement, um, there, there was this practice of minus, if they are mining a neighboring farm and they want to negotiate with you to mine your farm, but you are proving difficult, they intentionally let the tailings of their mining flood your farm. So the, the, this farmer said that my neighbor had mined his farm and my farm was getting flooded. If I had insisted that I won't mine, I'll end up being a fool with nothing. So definitely that would, that would force him to give in the negotiation table. And then also they use certain enticements because the farmers live in a compound house. So if you go giving cash gifts to relatives, etc., it's a form of enticement to let you also give in. Again, in Kwashi, knowledge and information was a big deal. There was, again, no robust uh, financial calculations of their farm value. Uh, this, this female respondent says, starting a farm, you weed, you burn, and plant. One man passing by asks me if I don't have a husband, because this job is for men. I don't have any man, so I have to do it bit by bit with my own strength. So imagine, with all this, if you cut it down and pay 12,000 Ghana cities, is it enough? So to them, they don't have the financial calculation, but judging from their struggles on the farm, you should be able to give them a better deal. However, there was a big difference between Kwashi and Tete in this case. And it's a sound that he said, I accepted the amount because compared to what my capital I had a better deal. In Kwashi, in, from, in both communities, information really goes round. And once one person had mined and had information of the potential income that mining could yield, it served as a, a benchmark for them to be able to demand more from the miner. So unlike the first case where they, they didn't have the financial information, in this case, they had the financial information of how much money could yield. And this made a difference in the outcomes, which we'll see next. So what were the agreements? In the first case, which is the formal negotiations, outright payments, that's a lump sum payment was given, and that was the end of it. But in Kwashi, there were three scenarios. One was outright payments, also were given a lump sum. In the second case, it's a rental income. So in this arrangement, you give your land to them and they pay you at the end of every week. This is not a sophisticated mining. It's where they use washing boards. And at the end of every week, regardless of what you make from the mining, you give them a certain amount. That's to the landowner. And uh, there were these shared arrangements. Either you split the profits 50-50 between the miner and the farmer, or you get 20 to 40 percent of the total revenue. What did this mean in, term, in terms of amounts? And here I'm comparing it to the LPD rate. LPD rate is the land valuation division rate. In Ghana, the land valuation division sets a certain crop rate every year, which should guide negotiations. So it's a minimum amount that any uh, value or any investor could pay. And then the industry rate is what I referred to earlier. There's what another large scale mining company was paying in the Western region of Ghana. So, comparing it, we see here that the outright uh, lease in Kwashi and the compensation in Tete fell below these two rates. However, for the rental agreement, we see that the rental agreement, we see that it compared a bit favorably to the LBD rates, but it still fell below the industry rates. But the shared arrangement had as much as four times. What the LBD rates proposed, and about 2.5 times what the industry rate was. How they use this amount? Um, these figures were interesting. You see that in Kwashi, about half of them invested into business ventures. This number was much lower in Tete. Tete in the, the formal case, and then Kwashi was the informal case. And the expense of living expenses was a nice way to say that they didn't really know, they couldn't account for how they had used the money. And that was also much higher in Tete compared to Kwashi. Now the question is, is it because of the amount of money that they received, that's why they were able to use it better? But then um, further analysis showed us that, which I didn't show, it shows us that it wasn't only the amount that was received, but in the nature of the agreement. So because they receive periodic income, and literature tells us that farmers are not used to um, handling the bulk sum. 
So there's a possibility to not be able to invest a whole time, but once it's periodic, there's better planning and they're able to use it better. So we, sorry, I should have gone down. We conclude by saying that, um, yes, the negotiations did take, take place. So national regulations, international guidelines, societal norms, I think there should be negotiations. Yes, it did take place. Um, the factors influencing them were similar, as we saw. However, the difference was in the fact that in Pashi, they had the possibility to have different kind of arrangements, and they also had knowledge of the income, and that, is, that was what made them have a higher income compared to the formal case. This is what I just said. So our policy recommendations are that the LVD rates, industry practice, are influence the outcomes and should therefore be realistic. And that regulation, the national regulation, should allow for some share of the mining income. And then also negotiation teams should be well balanced and well constituted. Actually, we recommend that if this is not well balanced, it should even be deemed illegal until the farmers are well represented. No negotiation has taken place. And also, the periodic payments would be preferable to lump sum. And finally, sound financial education should receive any form of compensation payments. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for presenting those. Other questions? Yeah. I don't know if you presented or not, but for me, one, one important thing would be the comparison between the, what they would gain with the gold and what they were gaining before. To have an idea, what is the, the gap? Yeah, it must be big, but uh, do you have any information on that? So I should compare what they, they were getting with cocoa initially. Yeah, yeah. Oh yes, it's much higher because for example, an acre, an acre should be able to get about 10 bucks of uh, cocoa, but because of poor practices, poor agronomic practices, usually they're getting about five. So after that time, one bag was 660, so 10 bucks will give them about 6,000. But the minimum amount that anybody got from the outright lump sum payment was 12,000. So already the, the worst case scenario for mining was much better than it. So like twice, the much. worst case scenario, yeah. But I mean, you get the, the compensation only once, and like the cocoa production yes, is on a yearly basis. Yes. Yeah, it's on a yearly basis. So in yes. that respect, it's not that much difference. Well, you could say that, but then again, once the land is, is managed after five years, you could start farming again. Okay, so, so there's no the long-term damage? Oh, there are some good. It depends on the type of mining. So there are about four different types of mining. Mm -hmm. So depending, there are some that you could actually farm alongside the, the mining, and there are some that, depending on the kind of practice, there's a long term damage. Yes. But then the issue is that they expect if they are to use the amount of thing in an alternative livelihood, which yields an income, then you are covered for that period until you can start mining again. Mm -hmm. yes. But that's something interesting that you should. Yeah, so you did not explicitly take into account the type of mining in the... No, in this... In no. This big so it must be very different, right? The small yeah. scale and the large scale of the impact. Yes, they are. So we have the ones that use excavator, the ones that use grinders. The excavators will give you about four years to be able to bounce back. And then we have um, another gold detector. That one within a year, you are able to bounce back. But then we have the one with the grinders. And that one almost concretizes the land. So yeah, that, for that it takes a uh, much longer. But it's no open quarries. It's no quarries. No, no, no. But the this one grinds the stone, so it's not a quarry. But they grind the stone to bring out the gold. Yeah. So it, it works in that way. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And some of them take the stone from the, the farm to another site to grind it. Mm. So then it doesn't affect the farm, but if they do the grinding at the farm, that's it. so there are so many different scenarios. Just uh, in Brazil, we had Serra Pelada, and I'm mistaken. 
started with small scale, but then at some moment there were, I don't know, 100,000 people there and it was completely damaged to a gold area. And then the government established clear rules. It was only big companies that would be in the state of the world. So this, this thing of scale for me wasn't very clear because I imagine that if you have a large scale, you have a big company with big investments, and they will have uh, all the food. And the small one can, can have much more damage to the environment than the big one. Not only to the environment, but also, let's say, impact on the people and many other things. And so you're saying that basically the large scale may not necessarily be worse than the small scale because the small scale can have more environmental impact. Yeah. Yes, if it is a big, big area with lots of small scale. The thing is that with the last scale, because they are more regularized, mm -hmm. after decommissioning of the, of, the, of the mines, they should, if, if they are well uh, supervised, they should be able to reclaim the land. Mm -hmm. But this is often missing in the small scale. So that is where you see that after mining, they may have more uh, dangerous effect. But again, it depends on the type of mining. And it's not always the use of excavators and the grinders. So these mediated negotiations, right, between uh, large scale and, um, and villagers or farmers, right? Uh, so should it be prohibited that they employ the farmers? Right? Because one of the requirements are always was okay, if you invest uh, large scale farmers, please also employ local populations because uh, that and ensures economic growth in these regions. But obviously, in your case, like this is used as an um, extortion tool to negotiate right? so, of collusion and drugs, right? Mm -hmm. If you employ local. I don't think it should be prohibited. But yeah. I think it is a good opportunity. Yes. So, as the first presenter was saying, that we want a collaborative something, not just pay them and they go. If you employ them, we have a constant stream of income. But in but the case, few. yeah, in the case where they use it as political tactics, that is where the problem is. You see, and employing those people didn't have been a problem if the value was still present. But in the case where they were so you could employ as many farmers as you wanted, but if they had a value worth, you know, still representing the group, I think that the outcome would have been different. Yes. Yeah. Of course, the value has to be balanced. Yes, yes. According to the Minerals and Mining Act, the value should be paid by the company. But I, I think that is also not, not a good thing. So, exactly, but it's not the. Yeah. No, so this value was opted to be paid by the farmers, but that also became a reason why the yeah. negotiations couldn't go through. So, in one of our recommendations, we're saying that maybe an NGO, some CSO, could step up and play that role. Yes. You know, so, in between government and the farmers. And what do you take into account in determining the value? Is it like the economic value, or is it also the value to compensate for any damage? Or, I mean, you can take into account many different aspects of value. Value for? Yeah, the farmers. The farmers. Yeah. Uh, our next paper is actually looking into this, because once we call compensation, it's a sorry excuse for the word. Because, you know, we are not, um, there are so many aspects, as you said, there's a social aspect, there's an environmental aspect, economic aspect. So to, to even say that this is value is, is woeful. So if you should look at all these aspects, I'm sure <laughs> it will mean more. You know, even the disruption of, of life as we know it, you understand. There are health risks. I mean, there's a lot of things you can think of. Yeah. And as I, in these two cases, we had that, you know, so... They would blast, and I was there, the land would shake, you could almost taste the dynamite, you know, all these things were occurring, yeah, you couldn't have a spring water anymore, yeah. but all these are not, so if you have a good value, who, who can take all these things into consideration, then you get better, meaningful compensation, let me tell you, yeah. that's what we are looking at next, actually, calculating this, yeah. Another aspect, I mean, there is a bit of a topic, which I have very literature on how, um, People, where there's artisanal mining, right, um, it leads to um, people um, having better economic outcomes because they start businesses, right? And yeah. so you also see it there, right? So it's, uh, it's good to 
discussed a little bit more because those are the actual benefits. Yes. At the end of the like, mines are there, so you can negotiate or sell water, sell food, sell anything. Like so industrial mining is just not possible. Yeah, it was obvious actually, you know, Tete and Kwashi, as I said, they are neighboring communities. But when you go to Kwashi, there's a new site, they call it a new site, they are buildings bringing up their hotels, their use of motorbikes and shops. And these are neighboring communities, you know, but just because the, the scenarios are different. And so you are, you are right, yeah. Skilson and Co, they've done a lot on that. Yeah, well, can we take this into the land market uh, system? Um, is it because they are willing to sell the land to the miner, or are they obliged to give up their land to the miner? In which because of the, the scenarios? Two, uh, the community, the land owners. No, in which of the scenarios? Uh, the formal or informal? The, yeah, I think we can talk about, about the formal. The formal? Yeah. So is it enforced like enforced displacement because it will have a structural impact? It will affect their livelihood. They will change their livelihood from being a farmer to some kind of uh, which, which will be positive or negative that we don't know. So. And the rights of eminent domain in our constitution say that all minerals are owned by the states. So it's really like not having a choice. So, so the relationship, the, 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 the argument will be made between the landowner and the government. Yes, yeah, so the landowner now and the mining company, that's the dynamic. So the, the government gives the license to the mining company and then you are supposed to negotiate with the mining company and get something good out of it. Okay, so you cannot say no. No. So, two days ago, we were at one of the plenary sessions. Yeah, how, how will not that be expected? Yeah. No, it, it can be. There can be a different outcome. But as she said, if you get the right value, you could actually be better off. You see, and um, yeah. there are so many integrative um, models that can be used. It doesn't have to be this we pay you, you go, we take the land. You understand? They can be integrated, but, and, and it's been done as well. It's been done in Brazil, it's been done especially in Canada. Well, most of the indigents, they co-own these investments and they are better off. So I think these models can be put in place. And also even um, the payment of the compensations could be done in annuity, you know, not just a lump sum, no education whatsoever, and it's wasted. But there can be. Okay, thank you very much. I think we can uh, close the session. It was wonderful. Thank you, Robert. Thank you.